Yeah, it's been, you know, some of the most fun I've had in my life, honestly. It's a guy uh, from uh, OpenAI. You know, look, what are you doing? This is like the greatest transformative mm. moment in computer science ever. Mm. The developments in AI are just astonishing, I would say, by comparison. Somebody told me you uh, started s submitting code and it kind of freaked everybody out that daddy was home. <laughs> Welcome to the boardroom. In this video, we're breaking down the return of Google founder Sergey Brin to the company, what brought him out of retirement, and why Alphabet could dominate the AI race. So I have a couple of clips here from a conversation between Sergey and the All In podcast panel. These guys are a great listen, all ex-Silicon Valley operators who are quite successful in their own right and talk to a ton of interesting people, so highly recommend their stuff. Now, before we jump into it, I wanna give a little more background on Sergey. So he is a Russian immigrant who came to the United States in 1979 at the age of six. He excelled in math and computer science and ended up earning his undergraduate degree from the University of Maryland and went on to become a PhD candidate at Stanford. So while he was there, he met Larry Page and the two dropped out of their Stanford PhD programs to co-found Google in 1998. At the time, there were already numerous search engines on the market, but their page rank algorithm gave Google a clear technical edge and the rest is history, of course. Bryn is widely regarded as one of the most visionary and technically gifted entrepreneurs in the 21st century and he's really in the pantheon of all-time Silicon Valley entrepreneurs alongside people like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, etc. So with that background out the way, let's jump into the first clip and hear about his return to Alphabet, aka Google. You're punching a clock, man. I hear the reports. You and I have talked about it. You're going to work every day. Yeah, it's been, you know, some of the most fun I've had in my life, honestly. And uh, I retired like a month before COVID hit in theory. Yeah. And I was like, you know, this has been good. I want to do something else. I want to hang out in cafes, read physics books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then like a month later, I was like, eh, that's not really happening. Mm. So then I just started to go to the office, you know, once we could go to the office. So this is pretty typical of these mega high achievers, right? You oftentimes see these entrepreneurs people who built businesses like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, you can't just turn that off, right? That doesn't happen by accident. It's part of your DNA and it's something that you struggle to let go of. So I'm not at all surprised to hear that he struggled in retirement and got bored really quickly, but you'll also hear that he had a, another nudge from some of his other colleagues. So let's keep going and listen to what else happened that you know really made him go back all in. And um, actually, to be perfectly honest, there was a guy uh, from uh, OpenAI, this guy named Dan. Uh. And I, I ran into him at a little party, and he said, you know, look, what are you doing? This is like the greatest transformative mm. moment in computer science ever. Mm. Completely. Like, and you you're a computer scientist. I'm People a computer scientist. Forget that. Yeah, you're yeah, the founder yeah. of Google, but you're a PhD student for computer science. I haven't finished my PhD yet, but working on it. Keep working. Yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> Technically on leave of absence. <laughs> right. And uh, he, he told me this, and I'd already started kind of going into the office a little bit, and I was like, you know, he's right. Mm. And uh, it has been uh, just uh, incredible, just to, well, you guys all obviously follow all the a AI technology, but being a computer scientist, it is you know, the most exciting thing you know, of my life, just technologically. So here's where Sergey explains that the AI revolution is where he really got the bug to come back. And honestly, shout out to Dan from OpenAI. I can't imagine it's easy to walk up to a guy worth nearly $150 billion and tell him he's missing the boat, but sounds like Dan didn't flinch. Uh, yeah, shout out to him. Anyway, for someone like Sergey, who's a computer scientist and has spent so much of his time at the forefront of the space, the birth of AI has to be the most exciting thing he could possibly imagine. And like he said in the clip, he's found it to be the most excited period of his career, which is a huge statement coming from someone so accomplished. 
But I think in addition to all of that, Sergey also understands Alphabet's position here better than anyone. And I think when it comes to AI, most people forget just how powerful Alphabet's AI assets and overall position are. So if you're paying attention to the AI arms race, you're probably watching companies like OpenAI, Anthropic, Meta, but the biggest sleeping giant in this space really is Google. And I wanna walk you through why. They don't just have great engineers or flashy demos, they have the total stack from the infrastructure to the capital, the data, and now increasingly custom hardware to dominate the next wave of AI. So let's walk through this in a little bit more detail. So first, let's start with Google's revenue engine, which is a strategic weapon for them in the AI race. So in 2024, Alphabet, Google's parent company, brought in over $350 billion in revenue. Now, of course, people think about the search engine, but when you break down their revenue, that's only 199 billion or a little under two thirds of their revenue. So it's still the most profitable business within Alphabet. However, you also have the Google Cloud business, which is extremely fast growing and becoming a serious contender against Amazon's AWS and Microsoft's Azure platform, which is doing 48 billion in revenue, right? So again, that business is an absolute rocket. Uh, but in addition to that, they also have the YouTube's ad business, right? Which does about 36 billion annually. And that's ultra valuable when you factor in all of the content, the rich long form video, audio transcripts, engagement signals, etc. So Google's cash and their revenue engine is a major strategic advantage, right? And it gives them a ton of firepower to outspend and outbuild competitors like OpenAI, like Anthropic, et cetera. And Google's putting that money to work, right? So second, Google is going all in on their capital expenditures and plans to spend about 75 billion in CapEx in 2025, which is up from about 52 billion in 2024, the year before. And the majority of that is pointed at one thing, which is AI. So we're talking more data centers optimized for training and serving AI models, expansion of their global fiber networks and edge computing, uh, scaling AI workloads across their internal chips, not just relying on NVIDIA. And this isn't a startup, right? This is Google, uh, one of the largest businesses spitting off the most cash in the world, and their scale gives them an overwhelming advantage in this front. So third, Google's secret weapon is really their custom chips. So while most companies are scrambling for GPUs, Google is doubling down on its own silicon. So they've already shipped the TPU V6, which is their sixth generation tensor processing unit, which powers model training at a massive scale, but they also have other chips like the Axion, uh, as well as one they worked with MediaTek to co-develop for lower cost AI chips. But in any case, the bottom line is Google isn't just going to NVIDIA or renting tools for the AI era, they're actually building them themselves, which is a massive advantage. So overall, when you tie all of these things together, it gives them a massive competitive advantage. So they have the search business, which gives them a global user base. Billions of people are already using it every single day. They have YouTube, which provides them one of the largest, richest video data sets for training in the world. They have the Google Cloud business, which is an infrastructure backbone that they have internally, they don't need to rely on anybody else's infrastructure to scale their compute or distribution. And they also have the custom chips that give them performance at a cost that competitors simply can't match. And now with Sergey back in the lab, they have their original founder there to also help support and tie this all together. So in short, they have the data, they have the distribution, the compute, the capital, the technical DNA to lead in AI. And most importantly, they have the incentive, right? Because Google needs to win the AI race 
because if they don't, their core search business is at risk. So the next time you hear about the Frontier Model Wars or AGI Labs raising billions, just remember that Google already has all those ingredients in house. So I know that was a pretty long aside, but I think, again, it's really interesting the competitive advantage that they have. Let's keep going and hear what Sergey thinks about this moment compared to the early web. Yeah, I mean, the excitement of the early web, like I remember using Mosaic and then later Netscape. Uh, how many of you remember Mosaic, actually, my weirdo? And you remember there was a, what, a What's New page? The What's New page is great. Right? Like you go to the homepage. Three new, two or three new web pages again. Yeah, it was like in this last week, yep. these were the new websites. Yes. And it was like such and such elementary school such and such a fish tank. Yeah. And you were like, Michael wow. Jordan appreciation page. Yeah, well, whatever it was, these were the three new sites on the whole internet. So obviously the web, you know, developed very rapidly from Quite there. Rapidly, yeah. And that was a very uh, exciting, and then we've had smartphones and whatnot. But, you know, this, the developments in AI are just astonishing, I would say, by comparison. Uh, just because of, you know, the web spread, but didn't technically change so much. Uh, from you know month to month, year to year, but these AI systems actually change quite a lot. Quite a lot, you know. The like, if you went away somewhere for a month and you came back, you'd be like, "Whoa, what happened?" So this is a really interesting perspective, and especially informative for anyone and those of us who lived through the early internet. So Sergey points out that while the web was a massive shift, the pace of progress was a lot slower and more predictable. So even today, a web user from 1999 would recognize most websites, right? Clickable links, search bars, etc. But with AI, that's out the window, right? When you look at these models, they've gone from, you know, helping you draft emails to reading your screen, summarizing PDFs, writing research papers, and running really complex workflows all in the span of like 12 months. So if you take off just a few weeks in the AI world, you risk falling completely behind. And I think that's exactly what pulled Sergey back in. Somebody told me you uh, started s submitting code and it kind of freaked everybody out that daddy was home. <laughs> okay. Daddy did a PR? What happened? Uh, the code I submitted wasn't very exciting. I think I needed to like add myself to get access to some things and, you know, a minor CL here or there. Um, <laughs> nothing, nothing that's going to win any awards. Uh, but, but I, you know, you need to do that to, um, to do basic things, run basic experiments and things right. like that. Um, and I've, I've tried to do that and touch different parts of the system so that, you know, I, so that, well, first of all, it's fun. And secondly, I know what I'm talking about. Um, it's really feels privileged to be able to kind of go back to the company, not have any real executive responsibilities, but be able to actually go deep into every little pocket. Now, this is just awesome to hear. You know, imagine being a mid-level developer and seeing Sergey Brin, co-founder of Google, submitting code to the same repo you're working in. What I love is how this tells us a lot about how Sergey thinks. He's not just coming in as some figurehead. He's showing up to learn, sitting with engineers, writing test scripts, running experiments. That signals to the entire organization, this is worth your attention, this is worth your time, right? He's not just curious, he's actually putting in the hard yards and putting in the effort to learn. So I think there's a broader lesson here, to be honest, that if someone like Sergey, one of the wealthiest and most accomplished people in the world, is diving into these tools and learning by doing, that's really what the rest of us should also do. And obviously, many of us probably don't have the technical aptitude that he has, but you know, just using these tools to better understand things, test things, kind of push your limit on, you know, again, using AI is a really good kind of framework to follow. With that, thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, hit that like button, consider subscribing. And if you want more strategic takes on business and technology, come back to the channel. 
This is Boardroom Wire. See you on the next one.